Good evening, everyone. Um, as Stephen said, my name is Dan Kim. I'm a vicar in training just up the road at a place called Wycliffe Hall. If it's your first time here, welcome. I want to extend my welcome to you as well. Um, praise the Lord, am I right? That's a great reading. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to start with a quick show of hands. Really simple. Who here loves music? <laughs> Virtually everyone loves music. And I think if we sit... If you say, if you say that, music is one of the most universal things that we humans do, isn't it? Every culture, every age has produced music. And why is that? Music does something to us, doesn't it? It has this hotline straight to our emotions and our memories. It connects to our hearts in a way that nothing else does. And we all have those songs, those albums, those melodies that we keep locked up deep in our hearts. Those lullabies that your parents sung to you when you were a baby. The breakup song, the first dance song, the soundtrack from a film that you just really, really love, or the one album you listen to on that one incredible trip that just takes you back there every single time, or the song you listen to when you first became a Christian over and over again. Do you have those nods? Yeah. Here are a few of mine, uh, being vulnerable here. So my three favorite albums of all time is the original soundtrack to Spirited Away, maybe the best children's film ever made, and it's so beautiful. Second one, don't judge me, is Ghost Stories by Coldplay. It's the one that me and my wife first bonded over on our first day of meeting when I was 18 years old. That's really special to me. And the third one is Live at the Banks House, United Pursuit, maybe, probably, the best Christian music album recorded this century. I will fight you on that. It is really good. We all have a different list. And I just want to ask the obvious question um, on, on, on why I'm starting with, with, with music right now. Because we've just spent the first half an hour being in this room together, making music, singing songs, worshiping God with our voices and our language and our bodies. We do it every single week, and if you're a church goer, you will know that Christians all around the world will always incorporate music into their services. And for me personally, music is an incredibly significant part of my spiritual expression. Some of the most important moments in my entire life have happened when I was singing to God. And there are very few things more precious to me than those moments when you can hear the entire congregation just singing in one voice with full hearts, zeal, and passion. Have you felt that? For me, that's like the sound of heaven. So today, I just want to ask a really simple question and consider uh, maybe an obvious question, perhaps, and that's just why. Why do we sing? Why do Christians sing? And I think our psalm today, Psalm 150, has some deep things to teach us about why we sing. So if you have a Bible, it might be helpful to have it open in front of you. And I just have um, two really simple points. The first is this. Singing is the language of praise. Our psalm, Psalm 150, is filled with music and singing. It opens and closes with this phrase, praise the Lord. And in the Hebrew, it's simply the word hallelujah. Hallelujah means to praise, and Yah is the Lord, Yahweh. And between these two great hallelujahs of Psalm 150, we have 10 calls to praise him, praise him, praise him. It's like a stuck record, praise him. And more than half of those calls is about music and singing. If you look from verse 3 to verse 5, the poet is just lifting off an orchestra of instruments. You've got trumpets and harps and lyres, which is like a little stringed instrument. You've got tambourines, you've got pipes, crashing cymbals, cymbals twice. A full orchestra is invited to praise the Lord. Even a multimedia dance performance is in there. Music, dancing, and praise. And then finally, the whole orchestra is invited to sing, uh, to praise, and we have this incredible climax of the psalm. Let everything that has breath, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Every creature, every human being, Everything that has breath in its lungs is invited to sing hallelujah. Our psalm culminates in singing. Singing is the summit of our praise. I think it's because music and singing, 
What we're singing in particular is, is what we do with our bodies, what we do with our very breath. I have a, uh, an interactive thing for you right now. Uh, it's quite dangerous in a British church, but just play along with me. Um, put your hand in front of you like this right now and just breathe. You can feel it, can't you? We do it every three or four seconds. It keeps us alive. And in the Bible, our breath is described as a gift from the Lord. Genesis 2, when God creates mankind, he gives us his breath, his wind. In Job 12.10, we read that in his hand is the breath of all mankind. Breath is a gift. Now, uh, one more time, hand up here. And say with me, Hallelujah. What just happened there? Same breath, in, out. But you made the free choice to express your language internally and made that silent breath audible. That's what praise is. We've just taken the gift from God, something given to us every single moment of our life, and we've turned it as an offering back to God. That's what praising is. That is why singing is the language of praise. That is why our psalm ends with let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And the reason we sing is there in verse one and verse two, praise him in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his acts of power and his surpassing greatness. His acts of power and his surpassing greatness. We praise him because God simply deserves it, he is worthy of it. We are called to praise him whether we're in church or under the heavens because of his power and his greatness. For some of us though, the words like deserve and worthy might have a bit of negative connotations. Maybe it conjures up an image of someone who kind of like is a bit entitled towards compliments or someone who's coercing us to sing. You, are, you, you deserve our praise. Um, but the call to praise God is nothing like that. And it's a bit more like this. Um, a couple of years ago, I was up in Scotland on a, on a trip. And we were on one of the islands called the Isle of Mull on the Inner Hebrides. And one day, my wife and I were driving along this narrow road through a forest. And then the weather was, well, November in Scotland. So it was kind of, you know. And as we were driving, all of a sudden, we turned this corner and we found ourselves on this incredible coastal road. And as we were driving, and suddenly the skies began to open up and sunbeams started to shimmer down on, on the ocean and the sea next to us. And we saw this, this is a photo. This is the, what, we, what we saw. Obviously the photos can't do justice to what we saw, but it kind of gives you a sense. And, and it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen in my entire life. We stopped the car, we got out, and it was freezing. The wind was blistering, we, we, were, we were cold, but we were awestruck. And in that moment, all I wanted to do was shout and jump and sing. I think we can all resonate with this feeling, being overcome by awe and majesty. Maybe it's a sunset, classic, or a mountain view, or even just walking across in the city for the first time. It's a beautiful place. Or it could be these kind of photos. Uh, who knows what these are? So these are the first photos published by the James Webb Telescope a few weeks ago. It's the largest ever telescope sent to space, and its job is to take the most detailed and beautiful photos of the most distant objects in our universe. We have a few more photos here. These are, this is real. That isn't CGI. That really exists. And when we encounter these kind of images and these kind of moments, First, something shrinks inside of us, right? We feel our smallness, we feel our kind of humanness in many ways. But then, all of a sudden, something leaps inside of us and we have to give expression to something that's happening inside of us that just comes out. And we would say that these moments are praiseworthy. They are worthy of our praise. They demand a response from us because to not respond would be seriously deficient. And in some ways, we would say that they are deserving of our praise. They are entitled to our celebration. God deserves our praise and our singing in that kind of way. 
but also he deserves it in a far, far deeper way. Because if all these parts of creation are praiseworthy, how much more worthy is the creator of all these things, the one who made all it? Imagine if you squeeze that galaxy you saw onto the stage, our brains would like will pop. But something greater than that is here right now. Every single moment we come to worship. And on top of that, how much more deserving is a God who isn't just big, who isn't just majestic, but who is also kind and loving? A God who pursued us, a God who became one of us, a God who showed us what he was like in the person of Jesus. A mountain can't forgive you, a sunset can't die for you, a galaxy can't love you but our Father in heaven did forgive you and he did die for you and he did and does continually love you. He is the creator of the universe and he is the father of our hearts. He is omnipotent, yet so intimate. How deserving is this kind of God? And so when we see God, when we come together and we meet him, when we discover him, when we are in his presence, It should turn us inside out. Everything should just come rushing out, and the outcome of a life spent with God should overflow in praise. Our songs, our singing should be love songs, full of intimacy, adoration, and it should be full of reverence, awe, and majesty. That's why we sing. It's expressions of our reverence and our love because words really aren't enough sometimes, and that's why we sing. Sondheim, the uh, musical theater director, um, he once wrote that for his plays, um, when the emotions get too strong for, for speech, you sing. It's like that. And that's also why wherever you find Christians, you will find singing, because every Christian has had this encounter at some point in their life. So if you resonate with this right now, I really encourage you that whenever we meet together, whenever we come together to sing, that you sing your heart out. Because sometimes our insecurity, our Britishness, our sort of inner self-critic will muzzle us and it'll make us want to hold things back. But actually, God loves the sound of his people singing. And your singing is an encouragement to the church next to you and also to the church globally. Singing is the language of praise. That's my first point. Um, I'm gonna change gear now slightly because there's a bit of a catch with that. There's a really big catch. Because some of you in this room here might now be feeling, look, Dan, I get it. God is big and beautiful, and I get that I should have this spontaneous reaction to praise him, but you know what? I'm kind of tired, and I've been a Christian for a long time, and When I come to church, I can't really connect with the songs, and I can't force it, can I? I can't force an overwhelming sense of awe and majesty and intimacy. You can't do it. And if that's you, we would love to pray for you at the end, and I get it. There there are seasons, long seasons of life, where it can just feel as if God is distant, and um, there isn't that sense of imminent presence with him. But I do think um, our psalm does speak to those moments too. So my second point is that praise is an act of faith as well. Because when I first met Jesus, when I was about 15, 16 years old, um, I was losing my voice every single Sunday. On Sunday evenings, I would belt my lungs out, I'd be hoarse on Mondays, I would book out eight hours with a few friends overnight in the prayer room to just keep singing for eight hours straight. That was kind of... It's a bit weird then, but 12, years, <laughs> but 12 years later, to be honest, that's a lot harder work. I don't, it doesn't come as naturally to me anymore. I'm not as enthusiastic, and it makes me really sad. And it feels like work sometimes to come into the presence of God. But Psalm 150 also has a deeper meaning to it. Because it's a song about praise, but it's also a song about promise a song that is full of faith. And to see that message, we have to start reading Psalm 150 as in in the context of the entire book of Psalms. And it comes right at the very end. It is the final Psalm of the entire book 
of Psalms. Um, one thing we can o- often overlook about the book of Psalms is that it is the book of Psalms. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. And I think we can often treat it more like a, a mixtape that we can kind of read a shuffle. So over the greatest hits of ancient Hebrew poetry 400 BC, I've been kind of dipping and dipping. And you can do that, and it is wonderful to do that. But when we do that, we often miss the fact that the Psalms has a story. It has an arc from beginning to end to lead us, to lead the readers from one spiritual posture to another one. And if you were to read the Psalms in one sitting, (laughs) from 1 to 150, you will notice a few things. First, you'll notice that it is full of every single emotion under the sun. You've got joy, you've got hatred, sorrow, forgiveness, anger, desolation, despair, anxiety, bewilderment, celebration, hope. It's all there. Calvin once called the book of Psalms as the anatomy of every part of the human soul. It's all there. Everything's laid bare. But you'd also notice, secondly, that the vast majority of all the Psalms is asking, or is either about crying out to God for help or thanking God for helping. It's obsessed, the entire book is obsessed with answering the one question, will God save us? Will God save us? That's the plot of the book of Psalms, will he save us? And thirdly, you'll find that the Psalms with a lot of negative emotions like doubt, anger, crying out to God will come earlier in the book, in the first hundred or so. And then the Psalms with more positive emotion, faith, hope, joy, thanksgiving, tend to come towards the end of the book of Psalms. There's a general direction of travel from lament to praise, from meditation to celebration, from doubt to faith. Here's a little graph, I like graphs. Just go straight like that. Um, Although much like life, uh, this journey is not as simple as that, because graph two, this is what it's more like in the book of Psalms. You kind of have some glimmers of hope in, in the 20s and the 60s, but then in the middle, it gets really brutal, really brutal. You have some Psalms, like 88, which just ends like this. Imagine if a worship song ended like this. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. That's heavy. And as you get into the 100s, the 110s, the 120s, 30s, 40s, you feel this sense of ascension, that you're going up this mountain, there's anticipation, there's sparkle, there's expectation, getting higher hope and faith in God. And finally, you reach the summits of 150. You are at the top of the mountain through suffering, through disillusionment, through doubt, through pain and sorrow, the reader is promised a final huge hallelujah. Psalm 1 begins with, blessed is the one who meditates on the word of God day and night. Picture of calm, stillness, anticipation, getting ready for a journey. But it ends with a huge, immense celebration. And that matters. It matters that it ends like this, because how any story ends gives the rest of the story its meaning. Like, can you imagine if Star Wars didn't end with Darth Vader becoming good and Luke Skywalker overcoming, you know, the Empire and bringing peace to all the galaxy? I like Star Wars, sorry. Imagine instead that Luke joins Darth Vader and begins to oppress the entire galaxy as father and son. That'd be really weird terrible story, but also it would change the entire meaning of Star Wars. It becomes a story about how good will triumph over evil and how there is always a new hope in the face of overwhelming odds. And it becomes a story about dad is always right, (laughs) might makes right, and ultimately the temptation of evil will overcome good, but at least they tried. The ending matters. And they're important not just in stories, but also in our lives, because our lives have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the lives we live are also shaped by the end that we live for. So the fact that after 149 Psalms, we end with Psalm 150 shows us that the end we live for is joyful celebration. 
that no matter what, no matter what we go through in life, that no matter what happens in our society, our politics, our economy, there is always a reason to sing at the end because God is with us and he has saved us and ultimately he will save us. And so when we sing hallelujah, praise the Lord, we're not only singing for what he has done, but we are singing for what he is going to do. You know, interestingly, when you find singing in the Bible, it comes in times of great celebration, but also it comes in times of great suffering and great trial. In fact, the only time we ever have an account of Jesus singing is the night before his crucifixion. In Matthew 26, we read this after the Last Supper. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives to Gethsemane. And that's been true throughout church history too. When in the book of Acts, we read that when St. Paul and Saint, when his friend Silas are in prison, they were praying and singing hymns to God until midnight in prison. Even today we see this. I recently heard the story of what North Korean Christians do on Christmas Day. Uh, they're currently living in a time of great persecution and oppression and they can't practice their faith in public like we can. But hear this, this is what they do on Christmas Day. When darkness falls, the believers quietly slip into the night and walk to a nearby mountain. When they reach the top of this mountain, they look to the south, South Korea that is, and picture in their midst their Christian brothers and sisters. Then they sing this song. Faith of our fathers, living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword, oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to you till the very end. That's praise as an act of faith. Praising God this side of eternity can sometimes be a tremendous act of obedience, resistance, courage, and faith. Now, of course, you and I here will probably not face crucifixion or prison, or political oppression for our faith. But we do face our own kinds of suffering, and we do certainly face temptations that feel like an imprisonment, culturally. Disillusionment, despair. Because when we go into work in the West, when we stroll our news, when we look at our bills, when we face sickness and the death of loved ones, when we look at the general chaos and decline of our age, we can be imprisoned by cynicism, irony, and this weary fatalism that the world sometimes calls wisdom. It is what it is. I hate that phrase. And that's the cultural ocean we're swimming in right now. That's what our society is at. You know, tons of journalists and authors have written various taglines for what the first two decades of the 21st century are. So things like, um, here's a list, the age of rage, the age of anxiety, the age of disillusionment. Every year there's this um, report published that tracks people's trust in their leaders and institutions. It's called the Edelman Barometer. And the consistent finding of the last 10 years is that for, for countries like the UK and the West, there's just been this ongoing decline in the belief that the future holds anything worthwhile and that our institutions can deliver on what they promise us. Distrust, anxiety, cynicism is the water we are swimming in right now, and I really feel it. And in response to this, we become all about damage control, trying to deal with the psychological damage that we experience by living in this kind of world. And so we have an emphasis, a shift, um, that prioritizes wellness and stillness and meditation and mindfulness and, and minimalism, good things, really good things. And that's true in the church as well. There are new kind of rising expressions in Christian spirituality which emphasizes liturgy and silence and solitude and contemplation. Again, wonderful things, don't hear me wrong. These are incredible things that help give us a sense of rootedness, security, and peace in our world. But Jesus doesn't want us to stop there. He has something more to say to the world around us. Remember, the Psalms begin with a picture of a man meditating quietly 
on the word of God. But it ends with every man or woman, all of creation, every single animal praising God with music, dancing. The destination is celebration. We might start in a place of stillness. We have to end in a place of joy. That's important. And so we need to be careful as Christians that we don't just fall prey to the general cultural trend of stress management. That's not what we're about but that we insist on the truth, the goodness, and the beauty of Jesus Christ wherever we can find it. That we insist on the end we are living for. That the one way that we can insist on this end is by singing. Singing praise. I think that's why Les Mis is so popular. Do you hear the people sing? Not of angry men, though, but of a joyful congregation of Christ-following, resurrected beings it's harder to sing, though. I love this quote from a theologian called Joel Clarkson. He writes that, to sing as a Christian isn't to deny or avoid the fallen realities of the world in some sort of escapism. Rather, it is to enter into the midst of them and to declare that though the darkness may be strong, a light shines in the darkness which the darkness cannot comprehend and which, in the fullness of time, will banish the darkness forever. I just want to read you a passage as I come, come into land um, from the book of Revelation. It's kind of a weird read, but it has these incredible moments there, which gives us a picture of the end we live for. It, 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 it depicts the whole multitudes of all of creation coming together and Jesus comes again to renew all things. And so listen to this. You might be very familiar with this passage, but imagine yourself in this scene. Revelation, 5, 16, uh, Revelation 21 reads this. Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more any sea. I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying this, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them forever. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said this, I am making all things new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That is the end that we are living for. That is why we can sing hallelujah today, because human history will not end in thermonuclear war. It won't end in environmental collapse or the heat death of the universe. It won't end with this slow lament into cold indifference of darkness. There is no hallelujah in that kind of story. But, human ins but to be a Christian is to insist, to really insist, that history will ultimately end in the healing of the nations, the restoration of the planet, and the filling of the universe with light and life. In the end, there is a great celebration, and that is why we can sing hallelujah. So I'm gonna invite the band up now, and we're gonna practice insisting on celebrating the age to come. And I would love it if, as St. Audates, we could be known as Christians who don't, who don't, who don't just sing more songs than other, other churches, but a church who really sings to God. Love songs, glory songs, celebration songs. And some of, us, some of us here might be just ready to go. And if you're that person, just please go for it. For, other, for others of us, it might require a bit of a choice. And I'm gonna encourage you to go for it. But then for others, I think you might really want to do this. But something is just broken inside, and I think the Lord wants to do a healing work, so we are also going to pray for you as well. So, let everything that has breath in this room, hallelujah. 
Amen.